It's now been over three years since I have believed that the earth is flat. And like everyone else, when I first heard about it, I thought it was a joke. Well, the good news is it's still a joke. And the bad news is you're three years into not getting it. So you initially thought the idea of flat earth was ridiculous. And then you decided to embrace the ridiculousness. Did a clown college offer you a scholarship or something? Yes. I definitely believe the earth is flat. I thought he was gonna say yes, a clown college did offer him a scholarship. Shut up and sit down, you big bald f- Please subscribe. The first, first reason is, is very simple. There has never been one scientific test or experiment that has proved that the earth moves. A 15 degree per hour drift. They've tried, people have done various experiments and have tried to prove that the earth moves but they can't a 15 degree per hour drift in fact my recollection is that einstein came up with his theory of relativity because he couldn't prove that that it was the earth that was moving see and einstein invented relativity because he couldn't prove that the earth is moving is like saying leonardo da vinci painted the Mona Lisa because he couldn't figure out how to paint by numbers. Relativity is about the relationship between space, time, gravity, and the speed of light. It's not some consolation prize for failing basic astronomy. We're exactly off to the best start, are you? But these are his reasons for being a flat earther, so why am I shocked? Well, the second reason really is a very good reason, a very profound reason. Ooh, I'm on the edge of my seat. A profound reason for believing the Earth is flat. I bet it involves ancient aliens, secret societies, and misrepresenting the word perspective, doesn't it? It's unbelievable that people believe this. But here's the first one. And everybody knows this. Uh, the first movement that, that people know about is the that the Earth supposedly spins on its axis eastward a full rotation every day and that's how we get day and night. The Earth rotating on its axis and causing day and night is not a claim. It's a fundamental observation understood for centuries. Or did you think the sun was just doing laps around a giant magical space pizza? And as far as claims go, I've got one as well. I claim that this guy fell asleep in every science class he ever went to. Okay. If that's true, then the Earth is spinning at the equator at the speed of 1,000 miles per hour. A thousand miles per hour sounds scary fast until you remember basic physics, something this guy clearly hasn't. Yeah, it's rotating that fast, and yet strangely, we don't all get flung off into space, almost like gravity is a thing. A powerful, well-understood thing. Earth moved around the sun, then the tilting of the earth would change the way that the sun supposedly hits the earth would change and therefore give us the difference in our seasons change in seasons a mystery for the ages oh you know a basic consequence of earth's tilt and it's understood by anyone who's ever looked at a diagram of the solar system but yeah okay let's pretend it's a profound enigma so if the tilt doesn't cause the seasons, what's your alternative explanation? Does the sun have like a summer and winter setting? You know, dials to turn it up and down? And so in order for the Earth to go all the way around the sun within a year's time, the Earth would have to move at 67,000 miles per hour. Okay, so another statement of fact framed to sound unbelievable. Yes, 67,000 miles per hour. But we're also traveling through the galaxy at about 490,000 miles per hour relative to the cosmic microwave background. It's almost like space is really, really big. That's only two of the four movements of the Earth. The third, our solar system, the sun, the Earth, and the planets, Venus, Mars, etc. whirl around the center of our galaxy at 490,000 miles per hour. Is this going to be another that's faster than my car, therefore impossible argument? Because so far all you've done is state facts. So you've got these three movements going on, but that's not all. 
Scientists speculate that our galaxy is hurtling toward the great attractor, the great attractor. No, they will not believe in God, but there is a great attractor. And what is it? It's a region in space roughly 150 million light years away from us. 150 million light years away from us. And how fast is it going? 2,227,273 miles per hour. Scientists don't believe in the Great Attractor in the same way as somebody believes in a god. They accept the evidence for it, which is a very different thing. The Great Attractor is a real thing, and yeah, galaxies are moving towards it at incredible speeds. But that's astrophysics. Whether individual scientists believe in God is a completely separate issue and has absolutely nothing at all to do with gravity or galactic motion. And the Great Attractor is 150 million light years away from us. How far is that? Well, it's uh, 150 million light years, isn't it? It's so far that even light the fastest thing in the universe takes 150 million years to get there. Well, a light year is six trillion miles. Well, it's 5.878625 trillion miles, actually, but I'm not going to be accused of being pedantic, so six trillion is five. Mm, I agree as well, pedantic. So, 150 million light years represents nine times 10 to the 20th power miles away which is 100 quintillion miles away. Yep, that's a big number. In fact, it's so big, it's got its own special name. A really, really big number. <laughs> Astronomers use light years precisely because miles get unwieldy at these distances. It would be like measuring the distance from New York to Tokyo in millimeters. But we know, we know, we scientists know there is a great attractor out there. He mocks scientific knowledge while relying on technology built off scientific knowledge to broadcast his ignorance. The irony is thicker than his skull. Oh, the irony! It's too much! Scientists know because they use things like evidence and observations. It's a wild concept, I know. Maybe try it sometime, instead of just staring at your feet and declaring the Earth is flat. Well, that's my second reason why I believe that we live on a flat Earth, because there's no way. There's no way that the Earth is moving in four directions at speeds that boggle the mind. But there is a way. It's called inertia. We don't feel the Earth moving for the same reasons we don't feel ourselves moving at 500 miles per hour on a plane. You're moving with it. Everything around you is moving at the same speed, and speeds only boggle the mind if you don't grasp the sheer scale of the universe. But to be fair, most flat earthers' minds are completely boggled to begin with. Speeds that we can't even comprehend. But that's just you don't understand it or you can't comprehend it, so it must be fake. That's just a long drawn out way of saying, nah. -uh. My third reason why I believe that we live on a flat earth is that there is a fixed order of the stars, the sun, and the moon. A fixed order. But the sun and moon's fixed order is precisely because of Earth's rotation and orbit. The predictable paths are evidence for the heliocentric model, not against it. The stars appear fixed because they're incredibly far away. These are small, but the ones out there are far away. <laughs> Their actual motion is measurable, but over very long time scales. Fourth reason that I believe in a flat Earth is that there is no Coriolis effect. There is a Coriolis effect. It's why hurricanes rotate counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere and clockwise in the southern hemisphere. It also affects long range artillery, weather patterns and ocean currents. So for example, the Earth is supposedly moving to the east at about a thousand miles per hour. And so if you have an airplane that's flying 
And that airplane has to land on a runway that's running from south to north. And it's coming in from the south. The Coriolis effect would say that that airplane has to be moving a little bit to the east in order to just hit that runway right. Where, where was it you graduated from again? Hmm? The University of Duh. That's a bit of a stretch, even for a flat earther. The Coriolis effect is more significant over long distances and long time scales. It's crucial for understanding things like large scale weather systems and ocean currents, which move over hundreds or more miles every hour of every day. The distances and times involved in a typical aircraft landing approach are far too small for the Coriolis effect to have a noticeable impact. A plane might be on its final approach for just a few miles and a few minutes. Why is it called an airplane? Because it moves in the air over the plane. <laughs> So by that logic, are pineapples called pineapples because they grow on pine trees? Are butterflies called butterflies because they're made of butter? The word aeroplane comes from the Greek words air, meaning air, and planos, which means wondering. It has nothing to do with the shape of the earth. Number five, the fifth reason I believe in a flat earth is that airplanes, you know, they fly level, right? If they were flying over a sphere, they would constantly have to be dipping their nose down in order to stay with the contour of the Earth. Pilots don't need to constantly dip the nose because gravity is constantly pulling the plane towards the center of the Earth. That's what keeps the plane following the curve without any conscious effort from the pilot. And this is such a stupid flat Earth proof, I'm not even gonna waste any more time on it. So, uh, next. Then the sixth reason I believe in a flat earth, and it's so simple, use your mind, use your logic. God damn it, are you with me? Think logically, think like a human being. <laughs> you know, we are herded like sheep and depends these days because we listen to lies and liars and we let them deceive us. I know, but one day with a little bit of luck, maybe we'll be able to get rid of flat earthers completely. The sixth reason, there could be no independent wind currents on the earth if the earth were moving through space in four different directions. The atmosphere isn't just sitting still while the Earth spins on orbit. It's attached to the Earth by gravity and moves with it. Wind currents are caused by differences in temperature and pressure within that moving atmosphere, not by Earth's movement through space. The butterfly. How could that butterfly even get up in the air? Well, flat earth of butterflies can't because remember, they're all made of butter and it's a sunny day. He's already started melting. He's not flying anywhere. When a butterfly beats its wings, it's just strong enough to break free of gravity's grip. You know, they always say gravity is the answer to everything. How does that butterfly defy gravity? It doesn't. It overcomes it by beating its wings. Or is it flapping? The butterflies beat or flap? <laughs> My eighth reason, there is no observable curvature over either water or land. The Earth is enormous. The curvature is subtle over short distances. You can't really see it with the naked eye from ground level because your line of sight is limited. But you could always watch ships disappear hull first over the horizon. Just go outside and check. You'll see that it's true. You know how you flat earthers like to zoom in on ships you can't see with the naked eye and then zoom back out and claim that that debunks curvature? Well, Instead, stay zoomed in until the ship completely disappears from view, then explain where it went. Well, we're waiting. Now, the ninth reason is using legit, logic, I'm sorry, logic based upon... Circular reasoning. Yeah, we get it, pal, and I don't know if you noticed it yourself, but you missed out number seven. These things that we see in nature. Logic says this. First of all, the logical proposition 
And I did a whole video on this. You could look it up and find it if you want to. But logically, there is this. If the earth is a sphere, then there is curvature on the earth. Do you understand what that means? Yeah, that the earth is not flat. So if the earth is flat, why can't we see infinitely far with a powerful enough telescope? What's blocking the view? A giant wall of ice? <laughs> now there is a logical theorem, logical truth. I have completed entire courses in logic, by the way. Well, I hope you didn't pay for them. The contrapositive statement. The contrapositive is this. If there is no curvature, then the Earth is not a sphere. The logic is sound, kind of, but the premise is wrong. There is curvature. We've measured it. We've seen it. We've got photographs of it from space. Your argument falls apart because it's based on a false assumption. So you know that it's a logically true statement to say that if the Earth is a sphere, then there is curvature. That is logically true. Hang on a second. Now, my wife always tells me I don't pay attention when somebody's speaking to me, but I'm starting to doubt that this guy's even a flat earther because everything he's saying suggests that he knows the Earth isn't flat. But he started his video by saying he was going to give us 10 reasons why he's a flat earther. What's going on? But anyway, the 10th reason. All scripture references. No, it looks like we're missing number 10 out because the Bible is not now, nor was it ever a scientific textbook. The Bible proves nothing. And if that's what you think is your best proof, then you needn't have bothered with the other nine. No, actually the other eight because you missed out seven. Thank you all so much for watching and I will see you again on Monday. Love you. Bye. A woman asks her husband, if I died in a foreign city, say maybe Jerusalem, and it would cost $30,000 to have my body returned home, or $500 to have me buried right there, what would you do? So he thought about it for a while and then he said, well, I would pay to have your body returned home. Because about 2,000 years ago, a man died and was buried in Jerusalem. And then three days later, he came back. And I'm not taking that risk with you. You f***ing prats.